you want to support us, you can go to skeptic.com slash donate to support uh, the Skeptic Society. We're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, science education organization devoted to studying all kinds of interesting and controversial topics. Okay. My guest today is Professor William Magnuson, an associate professor at Texas A&M Law School, where he teaches corporate law. Previously, he taught law at Harvard University. He's the author of Blockchain Democracy. Ooh, we got to touch on that today because of everything that's been going on with blockchain. <laughs> and he's written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and Bloomberg. And he lives in Austin, Texas, one of the cool cities of the country. Everybody I know in California is moving to Austin. What is going on there? <laughs> it's a good place. Everybody should move here. <laughs> the new book is called For Profit, A History of Corporations. Uh, William, this is a beautiful cover. I have to tell you, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed the book. It sounds like, you know, it's going to be graduate level course in economics and business or something like that. And it's not. It's super interesting. It's like regular people like me can read it and, and actually learn something. Here's why I think this is important, because so much of the world really runs on the kind of stuff you're writing about here. I mean, stuff you don't even think about that's going on that just sort of runs underneath the uh, uh, our radar all of the time that affects major world events constantly. Yeah, and that's really the reason why I wrote the book in the first place is that I had spent my career studying and working for corporations. And I thought there's this institution that is sort of the, the foundation of capitalism. It's what we all work for. And uh, we buy all of our products from them. We get all our services from them. Uh, and I wanted to learn more about why it was that we created them in the first place. What was the purpose behind the corporation? How has it achieved and not achieved its purposes over time? And where might we go next from uh, in the world of capitalism? Yeah, and I really didn't think about it going all the way back to Roman times and that this was in part what funded these massive Roman armies and how they were able to extend so far beyond their original territory, they would not have been able to do that without something like the idea of a corporation. That's right. I've always, uh, I've always loved the, the study of, of ancient Rome and the Roman Republic. I studied Latin in, in high school. And mm. so I, uh, when I'm in the book, I, I was very excited when I, when I saw that, that, that this institution that was called the Societas Publicanorum, basically a company of publicans, uh, was created and looked a lot like a modern corporation. It had limited liability for certain um, uh, owners. Uh, it could con continue after the death of a partner. Uh, and it did all these services that we think of today as services that you would typically include within a, within a government service, right? It collected taxes for the Roman Republic. It built roads. It supplied uh, equipment for the army. One of my, uh, one of my favorite stories about uh, about the Roman corporations, and one that I think really illustrates one of the core purposes behind the corporation, was this story that Livy tells us uh, about in the middle of the Punic War. The Roman Republic is at war with Carthage, uh, and, they, uh, and they're in trouble. Publius Cornelius Scipio writes a letter to the Senate and says, listen, if you don't supply us with equipment and arms, we're going to be out of the field very soon. Uh, but the Roman Senate didn't have any money. It, it run, its treasury was empty. And so it made a, a plea to the people of Rome and said, uh, if you could help us, we would uh, very much appreciate it. We need your assistance. And Livy writes that three companies made up of 19 different people came together and offered to provide and equip the Roman army. And all they requested was that they be reimbursed for any, lo any uh, losses that they had at cargo at sea. And so they, this agreement was reached. They ended up shipping all these materials. It was, um, uh, they, Publius Cornelius Scipio received the uh, equipment and the arms that he needed. And soon the course of the war had changed. He had uh, made one, one over a series of battles and, and the Punic War ended up going in favor of ancient Rome. And so I think that gave, gives us a sense of why we created the corporation in the first place. Right? There are things that the government can do, but there's also things that the government can't do. And so we've created these entities in order to provide services to the public. Now, of course, it, over time, that's shifted. It's evolved what exactly those services and needs are. But it does give you a sense of how long and time-tested that tradition of corporations promoting the public good, the public good of, of everyone, uh, has, has been rooted in our history. Why can't the government just do those things? Why can't the government just say, we're going to raise taxes and, and fund an army, uh, Rome, or even the Revolutionary War. I mean, if I recall my history right, I mean, the, you know, a lot of the soldiers were just, they brought their own rifles and, and they brought their own shoes and 
close and because government just didn't have the money, why can't they just print money and go, okay, uh, we're going to fund this? Well, they could do it if they um, if they were willing, if they had the political will and the, the populace was willing to support it. They could do all these things that we typically think of as being corporate activities. One of the reasons why they don't do it is that they don't think that they're as good as private enterprises are at providing those services, right? There's a reason why, right, Apple and Google are, are the sort of the technology giants that we have today, not some government uh, service. It's that this, this profit motive that entrepreneurs are drawn to innovate and work together and draw together engineers uh, into the corporate structure because the corporate structure is this great vessel for, econ for the economic world. And so I think that's part of the reason why we've shifted all these things that um, uh, why, why we don't have governments do all this. We think that corporations are actually more efficient and better at providing many of the goods that we all value today. Mm. So in hindsight, it might be easy to say, well, everybody needs a laptop and an iPhone and Internet access. So the government's going to do that. But in the 1980s, we had no idea we were going to need this. <laughs> And so there's no way a government group of uh, eight, eight government bureaucrats are going to sit down and go, OK, what are Americans going to need in 2022? Oh, I know we got to have Internet. But so it takes a Steve Jobs and a Google Boys and a Bill Gates and so on to do all that uh, and risk it because maybe they're wrong. I mean, we the hindsight bias, we know they turned out to be right. And OK, good. Uh, but what we I call this the biography bias after um, the Steve Jobs died and and. Um, What's his name's biography of him came out. Um, uh, uh, anyway, sorry, I spaced out on his name. Walter Isaacson, great biography. But everybody's reading that, you know, by the millions. What was the secret sauce, right? Okay, so you go to a, 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 an exclusive liberal arts college, you drop out, you move back to your parents' house, you start a company in your basement with your buddies, and then you get to be a billionaire. <laughs> yeah, but how many guys in the 70s <laughs> dropped out of college, moved back to their parents' house, and we don't even know who they are because their companies failed, right? No, that's a great point. Yeah, I mean, and that is that is one of the, the the reasons why we created the corporation, right? Was to allow people to take those risks. The reason why we, the, if you go back to the joint stock company in Elizabethan England, what was the idea behind the joint stock company? Well, it was that there was these really expensive and risky adventures that 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 were needed to be comp completed, right? They were trying to sit, send ships and voyages over to the East India, right, hundreds and thousands of miles away across dangerous territories. Uh, and the government wasn't willing to, to do those risks. Uh, and typically, the average person wasn't going to either have the capital or the willingness to, make, to, to, to take those risks either. And so instead, they created something called the Joint Stock Company, which shifted the risk that says, listen, we're going to raise capital from the public, raise money from the public. But the public is not going to be, at the end of the day, we can't go and sue them if there's a loss. Uh, they're going to have limited liability. We can't go and take their houses. We can't go and take their retirement accounts if something goes wrong in this company. And so it was a way to and, and uh, to take the capital of the public, right, to allow people to invest in enterprises that they believe in, and then protect them in the instance that something goes wrong. Right. So it's a way of saying to um, the Mark Zuckerberg wannabes, uh, we're going to cover you for losses. Uh, and limited liability, but you may lose all your money. Too bad. We're not going to bail you out on that. Take all the risks you want. We know most of you're going to fit 99% of you will not become Facebook. Whatever it is, probably one out of a thousand become Facebook of startups, whatever the number is. Uh, so we, we as a government or society are saying we want to make the payoff so huge that, that the other 999 people want to try to do it. And we're not going to cover them either. It's just the way it goes. Uh, and, and so go, <laughs> right? And then we end up with that. Yeah, the story of Facebook, and there I have a chapter in the book about Facebook, yeah. which I think is a really fascinating story. I mean, this was uh, the idea of a corporation being founded by a 19-year-old college <laughs> student out of his dorm room, right? This is completely unprecedented in the history of corporations. Uh, and so it's sort of an exciting change in the world. And I do think that Zuckerberg had this fascinating uh, and really brilliant idea which was he understood what the internet was going to be used for, right? This was 2004, 2005. People, you know, the internet was becoming, was starting to become popular, but still most people were really getting access to fast internet for the first time once they got to college. And so Zuckerberg thought, well, well, what is it that people really like to do on the internet? Well, they like to look at other people, right? They like, they like to be voyeuristic because the great thing about the internet 
you can look at somebody and they don't know that you're looking at them, right? They don't know that you're on their website. Uh, and so, uh, so Zuckerberg hit on this great idea for Facebook. He also had some, uh, some earlier ideas that sort of played around a, on a similar type of concept of looking at what other courses people were doing. And, uh, and it was immediately an enormous success, right? Within days, almost all of the Harvard campus was signed up. Within months, there were millions of users, right? This was a massive success, way faster than any other corporation had ever launched before. Uh, and now we're starting to see, right? Now there's billions of users on Facebook and it's become this massive corporation. It's tremendously profitable, but we're also seeing some of the downsides. And so the book also explores not just the tremendous success and the brilliance of Zuckerberg when he first created this company, but also some of the unintended consequences of that success. Mm. Right. So, uh, you know, there's a thread of kind of resentment of the uber wealthy in America, the Google boys, Zuckerberg, Bezos. But I, I guess what you're saying is that uh, the government has decided, or we as a society have decided, we want to let somebody become just grotesquely wealthy, just un unimaginably wealthy to motivate everybody else to try stuff and because it might not have been Facebook. Maybe it would if it was MySpace or the equivalent of TikTok or whatever it would have been, or maybe people aren't interested in social networking. Maybe that was the wrong bet. And so he loses. We don't hear about him, what's seen and what's not seen. We don't see all the, the, the wannabe Zuckerbergs that failed. And so we want to allow that huge payoff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a way to, it's a way to let people incentivize people to take risks in their lives, to, to launch ventures, to study technologies, try to create companies and businesses uh, in areas where maybe there's not, it's sort of unproven, whether that hasn't yet been tested, whether there truly is a market for this. And if you're good at it, right, if you really do, if you can see the, if you can look at the tea leaves and figure out where people are going to be uh, demanding what they're going what the next product is going to be, then you can be, you can, you can become very rich, very fast. And that is one of the fundamental sort of lessons from the corporation is that the profit motive is very powerful, right? It gets people to work together uh, and it gets people to work very hard. Uh, they work late nights and uh, weekends, right? So in order to be able to achieve this goal and be able to provide for their families and, you know, in Zuckerberg's case, many, many generations of families. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've kind of noticed and wondered about, I don't have a good answer to this. What's the number? How, how rich can somebody be before on average people think, you know what, that just seems too much, right? Uh, I don't know. And, and also how the money was made. The analogy I use is my, my friend, Michael Cole started the great American cookie company in Atlanta. And he, you know, he was very successful. He sold the company for, he made tens of millions of dollars and no one resents it. He's a super good guy. He gives a lot of money to charity and he made chocolate chip cookies. I mean, come on, this is great. You know, as opposed to like some wall street trader, that's just moving binary digits around on a screen. What is he making? How come he makes $10 million a year? That just doesn't seem right. What is it about that intuition we have? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Yeah, I, and I do think that that number has changed over time. I don't know what it is today, but you're right that there is, uh, I think there is this uh, innate human tendency to think, well, you don't want somebody, any individual in society to be too wealthy, right? And, and what that is defined as, how much too wealth it, uh, is defined at any given time will change, and it certainly fluctuates. Um, over time, society has gotten richer and more prosperous, right? Today, we are able to afford things that we were never able to afford before. Uh, and so that also affects just how much wealth we expect or, or we think that there's too much wealth in a given individual. Uh, so one of the lessons that I think that uh, provides us some historical guidance uh, comes from the Medici Bank. So the Medici Bank uh, is this bank. It was founded in Renaissance Florence. Uh, by Giovanni di Bici de' Medici, who was the founding father of this great dynasty of banks. Uh, and so the Medici Bank, it was primarily, it was, it was fascinating about the Medici Bank. There's so many elements of it that's really, that are really interesting. But one of them, of course, is this great irony that the world's greatest bank was founded in Florence, which is just a couple hundred miles away from Rome. And in Rome at the time, the rule was, under Vatican law, the rule was, you can't be a bank. You can't loan people money and charge them interest, right? So there's this fundamental irony that at a time in which it was prohibited, you went to you went to to you went to uh, to hell if you if you charged interest on a loan. At that same time, the Medici Bank came about and became the world's most powerful bank. So how do they do it? They used all these sort of um, interesting and complex financial instruments. 
that sort of obscured what they were doing. So it didn't look like a loan, even though really it was a loan. They use these things called bills of exchange. Uh, but this lent, meant that they became really international. So they were not just providing uh, banks and loans uh, to, the, to, the, to the Vatican and to the Pope, but other church officials, to nobles, to dukes, to barons, to kings. And so they became very powerful very quickly. But there was a blowback eventually when uh, the, the, the Florentines sort of thought that they'd become too wealthy. They became too gaudy. And so there was this, uh, this, um, this monk named Savonarola, who by the end of the century was saying, we're going to hold bonfires of the vanities and destroy all these wealthy luxuries that the Medicis and other wealthy banking families are, are having. And so he had these big bonfires of the vanities and the piazzas are sort of burning all this wealth that they had created. So I think that's a great lesson about how what can happen when there's too much disparity between the super wealthy and the rest of us, right? That there becomes this the sense that these people have taken too much of, of society's value and, 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 put, and taken it for themselves. So you're, what you're talking about with the Catholic Church was usury. Usury is a sin, right? Yes. So under, under a Vatican doctrine at the time, usury was a sin, and usury was defined as anything that was beyond the principle. So if you give somebody a loan, you give them some money, you cannot charge them anything for that. You can only say, give me back the amount I gave you. Of course, that doesn't make any sense from, from a business perspective. Why would anybody do it, right? <laughs> yeah. So they actually make it, well, that's a terrible idea. So what they did instead was they used this thing called the bill of exchange. Uh, so the bill of exchange, the way that it worked is pretty fascinating, uh, is they would say, okay, we're not going to give you a loan. Instead, we're going to give you some money, and you will give us some money back in a different currency. So it was an exchange from there, from one currency, say the, the, the Florentine uh, uh, Petroli, and it would be switched to a new currency. And of course, when they did that, they would say, well, but give it back to us. Uh, and we're going to put the exchange rate and they would, they would play around with the exchange rate, right? So they would pl they'd play around with the exchange rate. And it would just happen that the exchange rate would be, you know, the going interest rate. Uh, and so that was the way that they got around this rule. They say, no, 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 we're not, we're not giving you a loan. We're just exchanging currencies. <laughs> and, so, and so it was a way around it. And they basically got some monks to, to sign off on it. And they, and they were off to the races. Uh, do you have any idea why the Catholic Church decided usury was a sin? That's a very good, <laughs> that's a very good question. I am not an expert in canon doctrine, uh, mm. but uh, but it, it's I'm a very good question. I'm just wondering if it has something to do with the Jews, you know, and the anti-Semitism yep. that's run throughout the history of Christianity until recently, and the fact that Jews were so discriminated against and restricted from most trades, they had to go into financial middleman positions in which the only way to make money, make a living really, is just to charge interest. And then that becomes usury. I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's a way of controlling property and wealth because the church is so powerful. And maybe there's an anti-Semitic streak there. Yeah. I'm only guessing uh, on that. But it seems like that's a common thread. You still hear this now, even last week with, the, with the Kanye West ranting about the Jews are running the financial industries and Hollywood and so on and so forth. That seemed like an old uh, idea. Yeah, that's right. And, and even at the time, actually, Florence did have uh, uh, Jewish bankers. Uh, and that was part of the reason why, the, why they were able to do it was because they were Jewish and not within the confines of the church. Um, although I do think there was this underlying element that where I think the, 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 the Medici and other Italian bankers at, in, the, in their true heart of hearts realized that what they were doing was actually providing loans. And so that was part of the reason right, why, they, why they lavished so much money on the artists of the time, right, to do these great uh, church projects was well, we're, going to, we're going to ensure our place in heaven by giving all this money to the church. Mm. Right. So there wouldn't have been a renaissance without corporations and the Medici Bank and so on. That's right. Because these artists have to have patrons or, <laughs> or however that worked at the time. Yes, the exactly. Patrons... They would, um, uh, and all the, the, Medici, the Medici were very generous with the, uh, with the local uh, Florentine artists, and they would oftentimes uh, bring them into their own studios, and they would have dinners together. I mean, they really were, uh, I mean, enlightened, uh, enlightened individuals. They were fascinated with classical scholars. They had, um, they had Plato's works translated into Latin. Um, they, I mean, they, 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 they just they spent so much money on on learning and knowledge and uh, and artistry that uh, where it was it, it stood to the benefit of really all of Florence.
I forgot to start with just kind of going through the definitions of these things. So right down the street from me is the Mesa Burger Place owned by this couple. Next to me is the McDonald's, <laughs> right? So the couple that owns the Mesa Burger, you know, they're just, I don't know what they are, just a small uh, mom and pop business and McDonald's is a corporation. What, what are the different structures that one can go into in business and how does the LLC, I guess it is, right, differ from those? Sure. Yeah. So this is uh, this is something that's, uh, that's that's very dear to my heart. <laughs> I teach corporate corporate law, so these are the kinds of things I go through in my class uh, yeah. every semester. Um, so I apologize to any of the listeners out there who may have taken yeah. my class. But yeah. So, <laughs> so the, the the basic idea behind the the corporation uh, is it is a type of business with 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 a select array of traits, and some of the most important ones are right limited liability. What that means is you can't sue if you get injured by the corporation. You can't sue the shareholders, right? The shareholders are only, they put their money in, but they can't get sued. You can't go after them personally. Uh, they're immortal. They last forever, right? Just because the CEO died does not mean the corporation ends. Uh, and they also can act as an entity, as, a, as an individual. Sometimes people say, well, they're a person, right? You, they can sign a contract on their own. Uh, they can enter into uh, agreements with, uh, to buy other companies, or they can uh, sign service contracts. Right. So they, that means these are three important traits, right? They have entity status. They're, that is, you, they're not made up of a bunch of individuals. They become an entity itself. They become a person themselves. They have limited liability and they have um, uh, unlimited life. Those are all, it turns out, very powerful features because it means that you can put capital and money into a company and then grow it for a very long period of time. So that makes it a really useful engine of commerce. Uh, but there's other types of entities that you could also form Right, one, the one that you mentioned was limited liability companies. These are very flexible entities. They're relatively recent. They were only for, uh, created for the first time in the 1970s. There's actually a lot of still open questions about just how exactly LLCs should be treated under the law, but they are by far the most popular type of company today because they have a lot of the good attributes of all the different types. Um, but then, of course, you also have law firms that are LLPs, which are limited liability partnerships. There's partnerships. There's limited partnerships. There's just a a huge array of, of, of entities out there, um, but the most important ones are the corporation and the LLC today. And is the goal then to separate the um, assets of the corporation from the people themselves that run it or are involved in it? If I fall it, if somebody gets hurt at McDonald's, I own McDonald's stock, I'm free, of clear, I can't be held responsible. That Bob Iger just got rehired by Disney, someone sues Disney. They can't sue Bob Iger, even though he's a gazillionaire. Uh, he's protected. They can't take his house and so on. He's protected. Exactly. Yeah, that's the reason why they. Uh, that that's the purpose behind it is to make sure that people. Uh, if you didn't have, you, may, you can imagine, for example, if you didn't have that, right? If you didn't have that protection, if everybody was on the hook for everything that a company did, imagine any time that Apple released a new iPhone and you know somebody gets injured because of it or they get sued because of some privacy violation, and imagine if you could go after any employee or anybody right. who owned a share for all the damages, right? Nobody would ever invest in a company that had, right, operations around the world. It would just be right. a, a stupid right. idea. And so instead, we've said, well, we, we want to encourage people to invest in business. We want people to encourage, uh, we want to encourage people to spend their money in promoting the long-term growth of our nation, the long-term growth of our economy. One way to do that is to give limited liability to shares. And that's the reason why we have the stock exchange today, right? You could go on to your Today, within the next five minutes, we could open up the Robinhood app or some other app and buy a share of Apple. It's that easy. Uh, and so in many ways, it's opened up the world to the kind of economic pro progress that we've had over the last you know, two uh, decades. Or even since Roman times, right? I mean, just <laughs> or, the average person today yeah, is so much wealthier than the average Roman was. Uh, just the size of the house, the quality of your food, the amount of work you have to do to get light uh or just anything almost yeah yeah and i do have a chapter on mass production that i focus in particular on the the ford motor company which is another miraculous story uh that henry ford created this company it wasn't the first car company but it was one of the early ones and it certainly was the most successful one and it very quickly became sort of the dominant company in the industry at some period at some point it was 90 percent of all cars on the road uh were fords uh, and of course the most popular one is the model t but I think that for me, the most uh, inspiring part of it is that you have this company formed in 1903. It opens up, you know, they're making, they've got a couple engineers, you know, crafting these, these little, uh, these tiny little cars. 
Uh, and within 10 years, they're making 10,000 cars a day out of their factories, right? So these pit forward, basically by looking at and experimenting with the ways that you could create and build cars faster, he, he more or less pioneered the idea of mass production, right? If you put, it turned out, it was not obvious just from looking at it, that it was faster to put everything into assembly line and have each one person do one piece, right? Hammer that, uh, hammer that nail or put the, put the uh, tire on or paint the side of the door, right? It wasn't clear that doing that, having one person do one element of that was better than having one person do all those elements of it. But he tested it, right? He would get time, uh, stopwatches and he would say, okay, how, how can we make this faster? We put it on uh, these little moving easels and, and, he and, he saw that, and he showed that you could double, triple, quadruple the speed at which you were making cars. He built a new factory that was all designed around this idea of the assembly line. And soon it was sort of dominating the industry. And so I think that's a really inspiring message about what the corporation can do, right? It has the ability to make things faster, cheaper, uh, empl employ more workers. And that can right, redound to the benefit of us all, not just to the Henry Ford himself, who did obviously become quite wealthy from this project. Right. So he made it so that even the workers could buy a Model T. <laughs> so that was the goal, right? Just everybody, including my own people, should be driving this car. And yeah. if I recall, he was so efficient that even the like the the wooden box that the some of the parts came in the, itself was used for like the floorboard or something. Like every pin, every cotter, every nail was used for so, something in the car. Yeah, Ford was this. He was a fascinating character. He obviously had some really, really deep flaws, including anti-Semitism. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but he believed deeply in the power of uh, uh, of the corporation to benefit its workers and society. Right. He wrote uh, tracts about explaining his views on this, about how work could benefit us all. Uh, and so he did, and he he came up with the idea of the five dollar day. Right. Well, he at the time the average worker on a on a car factory was making less than two dollars and fifty cents. Uh, he doubled it overnight, and he also said, you're going to work less. We're going to make you only work eight hours a day. And this was a dramatic change. It meant that his workers were going to get paid more. They were going to work less. Cars were going to, their prices were going to go down. And it all came, interestingly enough, at the expense of shareholders, right? So the shareholders, the profits actually did go down a bit because of it. But he thought it was worth it, right, to treat his workers well. Um, and it also meant that those workers became uh, more interested in the, the in the success of the company and had more commitment to it. So uh, it was sort of a win-win from the perspective of the corporation and society. This is what uh, John Mackey calls uh, conscious capitalism, <laughs> which is kind of a new concept, but he's, he wrote that to, uh, book to push back against the critics of capitalism. You know, it isn't just pure profits for the stockholders. He argues that what's the goal of corporation? It's not just uh, shareholder profits. It's, it's to take care of your workers, the environment, the neighborhood you're in, your store is in. Uh, and John does all this with his Whole Foods stores, although it's pricier, right? You have, you have to pay for this somewhere, right? So it's where he gets the, the line about the you know whole paycheck thing may or may not be true. But in any case, um, th but the idea is that if you're going to, uh, he thinks you can make more money in the long run. It's better for, for profits if you do all these other good things for your employees, for the neighborhood and so on. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm generally sympathetic with that position, right? I know that you know one of the big big debates today is about ESG, right? The environment, social causes, and governance, uh, oh, and those all okay. those themes sort of run throughout my book. Uh, I'm not committed to the modern world of ESG, but I do think that right that there is certainly a history of companies one destroying the environment, but also thinking about the environment, right? Thinking about how do we make sure that that their activities are not destroying our physical environment around us. Um, there's also a long history of corporations thinking about social causes, right? Um, uh, Henry Ford thought heavily about, well, what's the effect of, of, of work on my workers? I want to make sure that my workers live good lives. Um, uh, and then governance issues, to be honest, governance issues have always seemed to me like an outlier, <laughs> but, but uh, governance issues, you know, it's good to have a, a corporation that is run uh, with good executives, with good shareholders, good relationships between uh, workers and and the company itself. So I think all those all those themes run throughout the book. And of course, it's primarily I think of it primarily as a historical book, right? To explain the stories about what made these corporations tick, what made them uh, so successful, and also some of their downsides. Um, you know, you can draw lessons from history, but I think the most important thing is to get those stories out there and to tell them. 
Yeah, I like the story about Henry Ford, oh, but, but his extension of that, I'm going to get into the private lives of my workers and see what their moral values are and how they're raising their children. And it's like, hang on, how did the corporation get in? That's religion. <laughs> Yeah, that was the danger. That was the downside, right? He thought he thought, well, I'm going to co I'm going to commit my corporation to benefiting the worker, uh, and he believed that the best way to benefit the worker was to really uh, instill in them morality. <laughs> so we had basically a morality police that would go around and drive around town and check on the the characters and the virtue of their of his workers, and if they weren't, you know, virtuous, and however he defined that to be, they could lose their jobs, and there they wouldn't be they wouldn't have their five dollar day. And so that was a, that was a troubling aspect of of Ford's uh, Ford's corporation was that it became very intrusive into the personal lives of, of the corporation. And of course, now we think about it as the as the idea that we should have some separation between work and life, and that there should be a balance. Right. So on the you know five dollars a day uh, paying your workers to do this, what we would think of probably as incredibly boring, grinding, repetitive work. So that's a common theme critical of corporations today. But as you point out, people lined up around the city block to get that those jobs. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 there was a reason why it became so successful. And the reason why it became so successful was it had a, uh, a model of mass production that meant that it could produce cars better, faster and better than, than others. It paid its workers very high wages, which meant that everybody wanted to go work there. And yeah, the work was hard. Uh, and the book goes into some of the sort of the devastating... Uh, physical effects of working on an assembly line, particularly, you know, if you were the guy who was under the car, you know, bending over all day trying to hammer in the the, the nails or whatever they were putting in, uh, it could really be take a toll on your body long time, long term. And so there are these stories about people just being able to, at the end of the day, they couldn't even sit straight. They would just have to hunch over for uh, for hours at the dinner table. Right. Um, and so that, of course, leads to a reaction. Right? There's this you idea guess. that, well... Uh, now that we're going into this factory system that's very difficult for workers, even if they are getting paid higher, their, their lives are in many ways, in some ways worse. Well, maybe we should think about some laws about how you treat your workers. Maybe workers should have the right to negotiate as a group. If the corporation has become so powerful, so profitable that now they can sort of dictate the terms to the workers. Well, should we think about giving the workers some rights to be able to negotiate as a as a union? And so by the 1930s, there was this pushback on Ford and the other car makers. Uh, and eventually they had the National Labor Relations Act, which granted the workers a right uh, to collective bargaining. And so that is, a, that is a theme that you see throughout the book, that there will be some new corporation that creates uh, a new innovation, changes the world in all these ways, some of which we like, some of which we don't. And then society has to think about what are going to be the new rules that we should apply to the system. Right. So let's just take for fun the kind of libertarian far out position. Uh, we don't need unions. You don't need the government to get in there and pass laws. You just quit and take another job if you don't like it. And you can punish the corporation by taking away your labor. What's the argument against that? Yeah, the argument against that is, well, what is the alternative for the worker? Right. If it turns out. Right. So obviously in the in the in the perfect world. Right, there'd be some sort of balance between the power of the worker. Well, well, I don't know. <laughs> some people might think that in a perfect world there is a balance between the worker and the and the uh, and the and the corporation. Others might not. But I do think that there is a um, uh, the downside of saying that we're going to allow the free market to dictate entirely the terms of the relationship between the worker and the corporation. In other words, if the corporation can has the leverage to uh, to, to get its workers to sign a contract that, you know, signs away the right to their firstborn child, then that's what they get, right? Uh, I think that that right, certainly is a perspective, but one that I find troubling because it can lead to the kinds of bad behavior that we see, we see today, but we certainly we saw historically as well, right? Where the workers were treated terribly, where they didn't have long-term health care, where they, they, they were sort of desperate to be able to get a job that paid them a living wage. And it meant that they had to sacrifice sort of long-term uh, uh, physical abilities. Um, they sacrificed uh, maybe their ability to get a, a higher wage or their ability to learn new skills, right? And so I think, that it, I think that it is foolish of us to think that the free market acting alone will lead to the best of all worlds, right? Historically, we've shown over and over again, right, that the free market needs rules. And just because something is not 
required by law does not mean that it is moral. Right. So maybe I think seat belts probably would be a good idea, but my, if my competitors are not going to do it, and I'm not going to do it because then I got to charge more and I got to be competing, competing with that. So it takes a higher structure like government to say, this is now the law. You have to have seat belts in all cars. And then everybody says, all right, well, then we're all going to spend the same amount. So I'm not losing any uh, advantage to my competitors. Yeah, and I think this is actually so. So one of the most, um, or, or one people, one 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 scholar that people talk a lot a lot about in this area is Milton Friedman. Right? So mm -hmm. Milton Friedman yeah. is the economist. He famously said that the the only obligation of a corporation is to pursue shareholder profits. Um, but if you actually look at what he wrote, he said their only obligation is to maximize profits in accordance with the law and with cultural expectations. <laughs> so. I mean, it's completely the opposite of what people take him as saying, which is corporations should promote profits. Well, they should promote profits as long as they're doing it legally and in accordance with any expectations that they have, which I think is a right. very different proposition, right? And so uh, even, right, sort of the, the, the extreme, not the extreme position, but at least one of the classic positions for the, the maximization of profits, even that says, well, if the law changes, then, then you should follow the law. Right. A little bit how pe people misread Adam Smith, who was very critical of uh, corporations. And he had that famous line, I wish I pulled it out here, where he said, rarely do you know, business people get together before they start plotting <laughs> to, to fix prices and you know, basically screw the public. <laughs> so you got to have some rules on them. Yeah, Adam Smith. I, I mean, I love Adam Smith. I, uh, uh, the Wealth of Nations is a fantastic book. Uh, obviously, it was one of the, the, when we first heard this term of the invisible hand, the idea that uh, if we have all these individuals who are working just down of, out to pursue their own personal gain, in the end, this invisible hand will guide them towards the best result and all of society will benefit. Uh, but he actually reserved some really negative thing, really negative comments for corporations. As you mentioned, he said, you know, whenever you have two, uh, two, two uh, companies get together in the same place, they're always going to uh, negotiate to try to harm the consumer and harm society. Um, he did not, he really did not like the East India company because he thought the East India company was a monopoly and it was granted its, uh, its rights because of the government's interference. Uh, and he actually, one of the things that's sort of less known about him is his theory of moral sentiments. This is another book that he wrote. Theory of moral sentiments, he says, well, yeah, we have this invisible hand. We, we, we want capitalism to operate, but what do we need for capitalism to work? We need a system of trust of people who, Right, who pursue prudent courses, who aren't totally risk taking, who aren't completely inconsiderate of the interests of other human beings, uh, and so even Adam Smith agreed that right, we need people to be have an idea of civic virtue in order for capitalism to work well. Yeah, after the oh eight oh nine meltdown, I started thinking about um, you know why these things happened. You know, these like opening fake bank accounts and selling these. Uh, mortgages to people who could not possibly uh, afford it. I forgot what the term was, you know, no income, no assets, loans or whatever that term was. <laughs> um, but in a way, you could hardly blame the individual salesman, say at Wells Fargo opening fake, fake well, or any Wall Street trader, you know, just trying to make a profit in the same way that like in my sport cycling where, you know, doping became quite rampant. Even if you didn't want to dope, you kind of had to because everybody else, at least you thought everybody else, and we're pretty sure everybody else was doping. And this one particular drug, EPO, or erythropoietin, that produces red blood cell, more red blood cells, delivers more oxygen to your muscles. It's about a 10% difference in performance. You can't not do it. You have to do it if everybody's doing it, or you're not even going to be in the race, right? So in a way, even athletes that are moral say, well, I don't really want to do that, but you have to. So if you know, the banker guy is sitting there selling loans or mortgages or whatever. His boss comes in and says, how many have you sold today? And he's, you know, 10% below the other guy in the other room. He's like, well, come on, get with it. He's like, all right, what have I got to do? And maybe he doesn't want to cheat the system, but he kind of, it's just sort of, in other words, I'm saying a kind of a game theory logic that motivates it until everybody, you know, the overall governing body says, you're not going to do this anymore. Like wearing helmets and cycling. No one wanted to wear helmets, but people were dying and had injuries and, the governing body said, all right, you, you can't race unless you all wear a helmet. And everybody's like, okay, good. <laughs> now we don't have to worry about that. In a way, it's, it's, you, corporations kind of need that. That's right. Yeah. I mean, so it's, we, uh, it's, it's uh, what game theory would call a prisoner's dilemma, 
Yeah. Right? Everybody yes. would be yes. better off if they could just cooperate and all decide right not to take EPO. But every individual has this really strong incentive to take EPO, so they have an advantage. So you end up in this world where everybody's taking the EPO and they're all worse off because now they've got, uh, you know, whatever the EPO does to your body, assuming it does do bad things to your body. Um, and so, yeah, so this is a big a problem also within the corporate world, right, that you might be able to make a better uh, or a more profitable car if you skimp on, say, uh, uh, safety mechanisms. Or you might be able to uh, make a more profitable social media company if you're willing to steal all their data and sell it to people. Right. And, um, and th these are problems that we're still dealing with today. And right when you have that kind of a system where everybody has this incentive to cheat and sort of take uh, take some profits for themselves in order to gain an advantage over all their competitors or their consumers. Uh, that's the perfect example of right, when we when we need a law, when we need law to step in and say, listen, we, there's some rules to the road. You can compete, but you have to compete fairly. There's some things that we don't allow you to do because we think it's bad for us all. Uh, and there's nothing inconsistent with the spirit of capitalism for the government to step in and say, listen, you have to sell a car that's safe, right? You can't steal the user data of your uh, users on your social media company. Right. So these are uh, called externalities. So I, you know, I, if I can get away with polluting the river with my extra uh, oil or <laughs> chemicals or whatever I'm using to make my product, I'm not going to do it. I mean, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to clean it up. But it, and, and in part, even if I want to, but I know the other guy's not going to do it. <laughs> so it, it takes, again, a government to go, okay, this is now the law. You have to do it. And you have to do it. And you have to, you all have to do it. Okay. Then we're not losing a competitive advantage that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, and I have a chapter on, on Exxon, right? Which is sort of yes. the classic example yes. of yeah. externalities, right? Uh, you've got oil companies that are provide that are selling oil, producing and selling oil. Uh, and of course, oil releases when you burn it, it releases a carbon in the environment, which we think leads to climate change. Um, but why was it that we? Why, why was it that these companies were so powerful? Well, it's because there's an enormous demand for oil, right? I mean, I drove to I drove to drop my kids off at school today, right? Everybody is driving to work every day. Maybe not so much during the pandemic, but they're using other. They're using oil in lots of other ways. Uh, and so there's a reason why oil com oil companies have done what they've done is that. Uh, there's an enormous demand. In fact, our civilization today depends on oil. If we shut off the flow of oil, the economy would grind to a halt really fast. So we need yeah. that. I mean, it, we, we need to shift towards a more carbon neutral environment. But until we do that, the oil companies are still going to be necessary. And so the, comp and the, so the book sort of explores how was it that Exxon did what it did? How was it that it responded to the oil crises and the surging demand for oil as the modern economy takes off? Uh, and then some of the downsides. And, and yeah. I think there are really strong downsides as well. Let, let, let's go through that in just a moment. I want to make a final point about the um, rules. You know, remember when Obama gave that speech, you know, the you didn't build it speech and conservatives' heads exploded. You know, what do you mean I didn't build it? I got up early this morning. I went to work. You didn't help me. OK. You know, he was just talking about, well, you know, you have your company is sitting on a piece of land that's in the United States that has an army to protect you <laughs> from foreign invaders and in police departments that protect you from uh, criminals and you know you're driving on public roads your employees are all, are all educated by our public school system and they all learned english and they can do mathematics and everything you need you know so that's what he meant yeah i mean right so we are all so fortunate uh, to be to have been born into the most prosperous society that the world has ever known uh the united states today right we're still doing we've done relatively well even during the pandemic our economy has not dropped that so, so much. And a lot of that is dependent on government services, right? On, uh, gov on the police, on road maintenance, on uh, um, you know, tax, uh, the, the tax system and our, our retirement system, right? There's so many elements that the government provides that provide services to uh, uh, corporations as well. So I think that is uh, an important feature of the history of corporations is that there's always been this close connection between the interests of the state, the nation state, and the interests of the corporation. And so corporations shouldn't, uh, shouldn't totally ignore the interests of the nation state. Right. So things like, uh, what is it called? Infant industries, uh, subsidies or something. I mean, like I, I bought a Tesla and when I bought my Tesla, I got a $7,500 tax deduction from the IRS and I got a $2,500 check from the state of California. Oh my God. All right. So, you know, Elon's not exactly you know, a free market, you know, no government interference. Right. 
And but in fact, I guess it's the government's way of saying we want everybody to shift to uh, renewables and electric cars and so on, and we're going to incentivize it this way. And then wouldn't that apply kind of the opposite of what I was saying at the start that you know it takes corporations to come up with things like uh, iPhones and things like that. But the the government invested in the internet initially, right? And that might not have happened by any one corporation initially. Yeah, I mean, it, when you when you start looking at it, you realize that actually in lots of ways, in lots of ways, corporations are antithetical to the interests of the nation state, right? Is that and and right? For example, even just the idea of railroads, right? The idea of a railroad gives you a good example of this, right? So let's say you want to have a a, a railroad route that so that you can ship around goods all around the nation, so everybody can get access to whatever it is the products they need. Uh, you could have the government do it, and they could plan it out and say, "Here are all the big cities." And we're going to make sure that each one has a good rail route. Or you could have a corporation do it. But of course, corporations typically, right, you're supposed to have competitors. And that means that you might have two rail routes going to the same city, right, in order, and they might be able to undercut each other. Uh, and maybe that would provide better services in the sense that maybe one would have a lower price. But on the other hand, now you've got these two railroad routes that are doing the same thing and providing the same service. So in many ways, it's duplicative. And so I do think there is this uh, 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 this underlying tension in the nature of the, our corporation, right? The, they're going to be, because they're not operating in co coordination with each other, they can lead to bad results. Um, so I think that's an part, important part of the history. And so there are certainly areas in which the government can come in and step in and say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to subsidize this industry to make sure that we uh, shift towards uh, elect electric cars or uh, more sustainable infrastructure. Um, and those are things which we can, I think, that are very promising areas. In the same way that the government likes that I own a home, so I get to deduct the interest on my mortgage. It seems to like that I'm married <laughs> and have a kid, right? So I get to deduct those. So that's the government's way to say we're kind of nudging that paternalistic libertarian, right? Nudging people to make choices we think are probably good for the society as a whole. And no company operates in a vacuum. You know, you have to operate in a country somewhere. It has laws and we as a dem democracy, I guess, decide this is kind of the direction we want to go. So talk about the railroads and then Exxon in, in this context. You know, how is it we, uh, monopolies are bad. Okay, it's kind of accepted, I guess. Uh, but we always end up with something like a duopoly. Like how many search engines are there? Well, let's see, there's Google and what, Bing and Yahoo. And how many diaper companies are there? Two. You know, how many political parties are there really two? You know, is there something about just the economies of scale? You're always going to end up with one or two or three. How many national football leagues are there? One. You know, remember when the USFL, I think it was, sued the NFL for monopoly? I think it went to the Supreme Court, right? And they, they said, you're right. It's a monopoly. Here's a buck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's the way it goes, right? What, what is it about inherent in the system you end up with just a couple or even one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is uh, an important feature of our economy today. And part of it is simply the fact that we live in a, uh, a multinational world, right, where there's this international economy. Uh, there are great benefits from being large, right? The larger a corporation is, right, the less overhead it'll have, right? You still need, you need a CEO, you need a general counsel, you need a CFO, regardless of how big you are. Uh, but you don't need to pay them, uh, you know, if you have, if you have one company, you only need one CEO. You don't need multiple ones. And so there's this great incentive to be a one single large company rather than a bunch of small ones. Right? And that's one of the big drivers of mergers and acquisitions today is, well, there's synergies between having uh, uh, two companies merge. Right? The most obvious one is you don't need the same person. Uh, you don't need multiple securities regulation lawyers. You don't need multiple accountants. Right? You can consolidate it all into one single place. Uh, so there's synergies from being big, uh, and there's also economies of scale, the bigger you get. And so there's these great incentives to grow, right, to be to consolidate all of your industries together. Uh, but of course, the limitation on this is antitrust. Right? We have rules that say you can't buy somebody if you're going to establish a monopoly through buying them. And so we have rules saying you can't eliminate your competitors by buying them out. You can't engage in certain kinds of anti-competitive behavior. And so basically, everybody's trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we just have a rule that says we can't get that bigger than that. <laughs> At some point, you have to stop merging. And I think that's, a, that's frankly, a big driver of why, we st why we're left with, you know, two, three, four large uh, uh, companies and many big industries.
Yeah, I love the chapter on the railroads. Uh, I had no idea Lincoln was so involved in guiding that. Right. So if you let just the free market, you'd end up with a gazillion railroad companies and they'd be inefficient and most of them would fail. And so at some point, Lincoln and the government just said, okay, look, uh, we need a railroad that goes from here to here. And we're going to, I guess they just gave them the land, right? Or deeded the land. I don't know how, I forget how that worked. Because uh, they're just going across, who, it's not even all U.S. territory. You know, it's like, there you go, you can have it. <laughs> you know, that's not free market. That's the government saying, we're giving you free land to put your railroad on, right? Yeah, the Transcontinental Railroad is a fantastic story and also a fantastic example of, in a way, it actually is sort of perfect competition. So the way that Abraham Lincoln, so Abraham Lincoln chartered and, and, uh, and signed the bill that created the Transcontinental Railroad, or that was going to lead to the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, and there were uh, two companies, two railroad companies that were going to build it, one from the East Coast to the, into the middle, and then one from the West Coast to the middle, and they're supposed to meet. They hadn't actually, when they first announced, they didn't know where they were going to meet, so, so that provided some difficulties when they were going in different directions. Um, but they, they did, they were able to do it. In the 1860s, in the middle of the Civil War, they started building this. And it was going to, the idea, Abraham Lincoln believed it was going to be able to knit together this divided nation in the time of the Civil War. He didn't uh, live to see its completion. Uh, but he was a railroad lawyer from Illinois, and he really believed in the power of the railroad. Uh, and so over the course of the next several years, the Union Pacific, I focus in particular on the Union Pacific, but there's also the Central Pacific coming from the West. Uh, they put together this crack team of engineers. Uh, they hire all these uh, workers, and they start la they start laying the, the railroad across some of the most inhospitable, dangerous territory in the world. Um, and they are able to accomplish it in a remarkably fast time. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you can have a, a nation where you can ship things from the West Coast to the East Coast. It's a huge benefit to the nation. Um, there, but there's also costs. One of the costs is, well, they started encroaching on territory that was the land of Native Americans. And so there were these violent confrontations between them. And it led to real harm to the Native American communities that relied on these, these territories. Uh, one of the other downsides of the Union Pacific was uh, it was gotten into the hands of a robber baron known as Jay Gould, who was probably the worst of all robber barons. <laughs> and, he, and his idea was he was going to basically take the Union Pacific and turn it into a monopoly. And the way he did it was using all the underhanded tricks he could think of, right? He would spread lies about his competitors in order to get the federal authorities to investigate them. He would uh, create these shell companies to buy out his competitors. And so the competitors wouldn't know that he owned them. And eventually he did create a monopoly as soon as he got a monopoly on any given route, he would raise rates so that ranchers and the farmers would have to pay him double, triple what they had been paying before. Uh, and so this gave, gave rise to the Grange movement and all this criticism from society that the railroads were the initial monopoly that's really destroying American society. Which, of course, is a little ironic because today economists typically think of railroads as the example of a natural monopoly. That is actually good to have a monopoly on the railroad because you don't want to have, you don't need two railroads running alongside each other, taking up all this space, uh, wasting, wasting material. Instead, you want to have one railroad. So it's sort of ironic that the first example of monopoly was actually sort of a good example of monopoly, one of the good effects of monopoly. And eventually it leads in the 1890 to the passage of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which today continues to be the primary law that regulates antitrust and competition. Mm-hmm. Right. So then talk about the oil industry and how, what was it, standard oil initially became essentially a monopoly. They get busted up and then eventually uh, Exxon Mobil emerges as almost a monopoly again. <laughs> Not quite, I guess, Chevron and one or two others, maybe GP. Yeah, that's right. So then the other, the other, one of the other early monopolies was Standard Oil created by John D. Rockefeller, another robber baron. And so he was eventually... Uh, the, the, when the, the federal authorities, after they had the power under the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up companies, he was investigated. The, Sher the uh, Standard Oil was broken up into a bunch of different tiny companies, or not tiny companies, but like 30-something companies. Uh, but eventually, over time, X, and one of those is Standard Oil of New Jersey, which eventually becomes what we know as through, through renaming, it eventually becomes Exxon. But Exxon started regathering all the pieces, basically buying out their competitors. Uh, and they're still obviously it's not a monopoly anymore, but Exxon has a, has a has a pretty large market share and did for a long period of time. Um, and uh, and they were very profitable, right? They were oftentimes their their profits would be compared to the size of nation states, right? They were massive, uh, and they developed this sort of international network to track and find oil, which of course is a 
It's sort of an incredible feat to be able to figure out where it is that all this oil hidden underneath the ground is located. Um, and often, often one of the da downsides, other than the climate change rule problem, one of the downsides was that a lot of the uh, oil happened to be located in uh, jurisdictions that were not democratic, right? So the Middle East, uh, and they had the Arab oil embargo in the 1970s that led to real um, uh, damage to the American economy. And so Exxon was right in the center of all those debates, and it had to find ways to get new oil. And so it was constantly incentivized to innovate and create new ways to, of providing the energy that the American economy was running on. Yeah, I, I sat in line in my little Ford, uh, 1966 Ford Mustang, waiting in line around the a block to get gas, 1975, maybe or six. No, I think that was, yeah, I think that was middle seventies when those, Car no, Carter had, uh, sorry, 77 when Carter was president. And he gave that famous speech in his sweater and <laughs> it's like so depressing. And then all of a sudden, uh, there's plenty of oil, right? So, you know, I've been, I've been hearing about, you know, peak oil for decades. And is it that really, it's not that, you know, we wouldn't eventually run out, of course, finite planet, but that if there's more down there than we think, and these companies have to spend a lot of money in research and development to find it. So we kind of let a, have to let them make a lot of money because I'm sure they fail a lot of times to find it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, and so I think that uh, they were able to find oil in places that, that, that previously, after that, so in the 1973 oil embargo, one of the things that they realized, that Exxon realized was, well, we've got to start looking for oil outside of the Middle East. And uh, so they found it in the North Sea. They found it in other, uh, uh, in Alaska, Alaska, the coast of Alaska. Uh, and so they had to invent new technologies, right? Because Alaska's old. <laughs> the, North, the North Sea is a sea. And so they had to find ways to, uh, to get the oil out of these places. And those were also technical feats, right? You, need, it was, uh, you needed a corporation to have the research and development capacity to get that, to get that oil. Um, so rem another remarkable achievement. But I guess the argument that monopolies are bad, and this is why we have the antitrust laws, is because that really did happen with Jay Gould and Rockefeller and so on. Would would a Bill Gates, a Jeff Bezos, I mean, Jeff Bezos, essentially, it's a monopoly, I guess. Not, no one's stopping anybody from doing it, but how do you gain a competitive advantage over Amazon? But so what? Yeah, these are big issues that we're all dealing with today. Um, I don't have really good answers. Obviously, I do think that there are strong incentives and executives have shown an interest in gaining market power. Um, yeah. market power can be harmful for the rest of us. One, it can be harmful for consumers because it can mean higher prices, but it can also mean less choice, less variety, lower product, lower, lower products, lower quality products. Um, we may not trust the large uh, institution that happens to have gained the monopoly, right? There's a lot of, a lot of problems with monopolies. Um, and history has shown us that they arise, that, that, that it actually is a battle to keep them from arising because there are all these strong incentives within the system of corporations uh, to create a monopoly. So uh, it's a big problem. We're all dealing with it, right? Big tech is dealing with it today. The, uh, the DOJ and the FTC are looking into it. Major issues today. Well, I mean, Twitter essentially is a online uh, you know, platform that is the national conversation platform. It's the town square. And it's not that no one can, 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 uh, is allowed to compete. They are, there's Parler and these others. But, you know, I had Andrew Yang on the podcast and I asked him what I ask everybody is, you know, what, why not just uh, Peter Thiel says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a billion dollars and start the competitor for Twitter. So we'll have two Twitters. And then Bezos does one. Now we have three and Gates does one. Now we got four and Buffett five. And, but that never happens. And so his explanation was, because he's a politician, he goes, if I want to reach a lot of people right away, I got to go to Twitter. I, that's where everybody is. I can't go anywhere else. And, you know, good luck with Parler or whatever, but I got to be on Twitter because <laughs> that's where everybody is. Yeah, social media is such a fascinating um, a problem today because of precisely this point, right? It, it does seem like there are monopolies everywhere you look within social media, uh, Facebook, within uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, with an Instagram, right? They each there's really only one of those. There's nothing that re that really competes in the in the world of uh, uh, public opinion. But on the other hand, I do think that while they may be the one that the vast majority of people are going to, that Twitter is the place you go to to reach people. I do think that their monopoly is fragile. Right? There's not the same. Right? It's relatively easy to create something that looks that does a similar thing. Right? Trump's Truth Social. 
you go look at it, it looks like a clone <laughs> of Twitter. It didn't cost that much money to make. Uh, so there aren't actually vast barriers to actually creating the same technology again. The only thing that's stopping it is consumer sentiment. That is, are we going to go to somewhere else? And we, de- we did see, I'm, I'm an academic, so I do go on to Twitter occasionally. And there was obviously all this, uh, there was an uproar recently when, you know, when Elon Musk took it over. Uh, and we all saw this sort of movement to, uh, were there alternatives? I know a few friends that have Mastodon accounts now. Really? Um, I haven't, I haven't yet tried, tried that yet. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't either. Let me know how it goes when you do. <laughs> I don't, I'm not, I'm, everyone's on Twitter. I got to go to Twitter. That's it. <laughs> Just keep my head down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll be curious to see what happens with Twitter. Um, but I do think it's fragile. I do think they're, right, all you need is people to say, well, we don't like Twitter anymore. Right? We just need a cultural movement. Um, and if that cultural movement happens, then it can, it can happen really quickly. I remember when something happened with Facebook a few years ago where people got really mad at them. I forget what it was for now. But anyways, like there was like a, a million people quit Twitter. And it's like, you wouldn't even notice it. <laughs> not, not Twitter, uh, Facebook. You, could, you know, they have the three billion <laughs> members or whatever. A million, it's not even a blip. <laughs> That's totally true. That's totally true. And it is, um, uh, you know, as long as it's a classic network, right? It becomes more valuable the more people are on there. And there's so many people on there now that uh, that is very valuable, right? It's a great way to reach people. Right. All right, let's talk about your chapter on Raiders. This is something I knew next to nothing about, the KKR, Kohlberg, Travis, and Roberts, and what they innovated. Pretty much the only thing I knew about any of this is what everyone else does from uh, Oliver Stone's film, Wall Street. Uh, how accurate was that, by the way, would you say? You know, I actually, you know, every year in my corporations class, I show a clip from Wall Street. And, you know, it's not the least accurate thing in the movie I've yeah, seen. yeah. Uh, and then in a way, so the, his speech about his greed is good speech uh, and, uh, before the board is actually pretty, pretty, to- totally Accurate. reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> One can imagine a corporate raider doing that. Right, right. So the idea is that um, there are lots of corporations around. The original owner still running it. He's old. It's not that efficient. Uh, and maybe we make him an offer. He can't refuse. You get to retire and pay for your grandkids college and, and so on for years and everything will be great. Then we take it over and then we clean house, basically get rid of half the employee, like Elon did with Twitter. What were all these people doing? Cause I don't notice any, di- he fired half of them and it looks the same to me. So I don't know what they were doing. You know, maybe there, is that the idea? There's a lot of just extra inefficiencies in there that the KKR did. These guys are going to clean it up and then resell it. And then how do they make money? How does that happen? Good question. Uh, the basic model is relatively simple, right? The basic model is, right, private equity. Is, what does the typical private equity uh, company do, private equity firm do? Well, they buy a company using lots of debt, right? They borrow a lot of money from the bank, uh, and then they sell the company after, say, five years. In the meantime, they are making operational changes, maybe making some financial changes to the structure, the capital structure, and the hope is they'll be able to sell it for a profit uh, five, seven years down the line. Um, so that's the basic model of it. Now, why why is it so profitable? Uh, a couple of reasons. One is the incentives that are given to the private equity firm. The private equity firm itself earns what is famously called two and 20. They get a 2% management fee, which is 2% of all the money that they raised from investors like pension funds and retirement accounts and university endowments. All the money that they raise in their fund, they get 2% of that every year, regardless of what happens. That's a lot of money, particularly, you know, funds, funds are raising a billion dollars a year. Uh, and it's not, it's not that uncommon for a fund to raise a billion dollars, just 2% of that's a lot of money. Uh, they also earn 20% of profits. It's called the carried interest. Uh, the 20% of profits means, you know, if you, if you buy a company for X price and you double it, then you get 20% of all that, uh, that change in value. So it's very profitable for the private equity firm. Now, how do they actually make... Uh, make the profits when they buy and sell. Well, one of the big important features of the system is the debt, right? The more debt you have, the more leverage you have. If you spend only a certain, a sliver of your own cash and borrow the rest, that jacks up your returns, right? It's sort of the same system as a mortgage on a house, right? If you you can only buy, let's say only put down 20% uh, for the cost of your house. Well, if the house doubles, you more than doubled your money because you only put down 20% in the first place. So leverage is a way to um, uh, to 
leverage up and accelerate your returns in, in the case that it's profitable. Now, there's also downsides. One of the hey, downsides. Yeah, one, one, cl one clarification. That first step where the bank lends them the money to buy the company and the bank is make, doing this because they get uh, the interest every month on the payment of that loan? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And did, so, uh, did, so that, sorry. And did they get a payoff too when the sale happens? The bank uh, makes They might, but mainly they're interested. They're, they're, just, they're, they're mainly, they're just interested in it for the, uh, the interest payments and yeah, the principal okay. at the end. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Downside. Yeah. <laughs> uh, possible downsides. Uh, so one downside is, uh, right. So a lot of, le a lot of uh, leverage means a lot of debt. So a company that's carrying a lot of debt is risky, right? What if it has a bad year? What if it doesn't make enough profits that year? It can go bankrupt. And so that's one of the big concerns, uh, right? I, uh, the most famous one recently is Toys R Us, right? Toys R Us that all, you know, right. as a child, I love that place. Right. <laughs> it was, was that because of Am Amazon, because of online buying? They just didn't make that transition? Yeah, it's like so many of these, right, brick and mortar stores, they struggle. So they went bankrupt. And part of the reason was they had a lot of, they were carrying a lot of debt uh, from their private equity. Oh, uh, really? Yep. Okay. The debt was accumulated from what? Just payroll and just so much overhead? Expenses? No, just the acquisition. Oh, just the acquisition. Yeah, so the private equity firm, KKR, bought it uh, and, you know, put a lot of debt on it. And so they had large debt payments, ongoing debt payments that they couldn't meet because of the acquisition. Oh, and did KKR lose money? I don't know what the end, uh, the ultimate economic uh, uh, effect was for KKR. They were public at the time, I believe, the public company at the time. That it went back. Oh, interesting. And they might have sold it. Yeah, it reminds me of the you know the the um, hedge fund managers. Well, they make money whether the your account goes up or down. They make money either way. <laughs> it's like that book. You know where are the where are the customers' yachts? Or the clients' yachts, or whatever. You know, the hedge fund traders have yachts. How come the clients don't have yachts? Because <laughs> they carry more of the risk than the traders do. Maybe, maybe it's something like that. Yeah, yes. there's a great. Uh, there's a great uh, article by a guy named Ludovic Falapu at um, at, uh, at at Oxford. Uh, I think I think it's called the Billionaire Factory. <laughs> it's just an exploration <laughs> of uh, what is it that private equity firms? How are they are able to become so profitable? Right. It's well worth right. reading. Right. So then the other downside, as shown in Wall Street film, was the employees who get canned. Maybe they've been there like Martin Sheen's or uh, Charlie Sheen's father, Martin Sheen, in the movie and in real life. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, he loses his job. He's been there his whole life. What's he going to do? Right. You know, it's, it's not like the free. Oh, you could just go to some other. Company. No, there's there's no other options. Really, you've been there your whole life. That's the downside of getting rid of people that you, the company has, in a way, paternalistically taken good care of. Maybe our profits are not so high as they could be, but we, we want to invest in our employees and make sure they have good lives. And that, if I recall, it was the original KKR, the first K, right? Col Kohlberg. Yep. He had good intentions, right? He made cut really good deals with the owners, made sure that their employees were all taken care of. There wasn't going to be any shenanigans on, on the backside and so on. But then, <laughs> then that kind of shifted. Yeah, yeah, the um, and th so that's the second downside, right? Is that uh, if we're focusing, right? They need to they need to make these companies more profitable in a relatively short period of time. And so, what does that mean? Oftentimes, it means cutting costs, and one of the costs is employees. Uh, so that's one of the major downsides. Is oftentimes private equity acquisitions end up leading to job losses at the company where the acquisition took place. That may be profitable long term for the uh, company when they're when they're sold in five to seven years. Uh, not so great for the workers. Um, and so that's one of the downsides uh, of private equity. Um, yeah. And so they also, one of the, and that's sort of one of the uh, arcs of private equity is that there was a period at the beginning when it looked like it was primarily going to be friendly acquisitions, right? Private equity firms were ways to buy out aging founders who wanted to get some money now and be able to get out of the company. But then slowly it shifted into a much more aggressive system. That's why we have the famous book, Barbarians at the Gate. Oh, right. Um, right. Aggressive, right? They're going after hostile acquisitions. They're acquiring companies, even when the companies don't want to be bought. And that right. raised all these hackles in the 1980s and 90s. Astonishing that that was just, that, that's not that long ago. Who was the guy that went to prison for this? Uh, you wrote about him in the book, the really Oast. tall guy. Oh, Milcom. Uh, Milcom, right. What was he doing that was 
That was slightly different than the KKR Ooh. thing, right? Yeah, there, I think it ended up. I think it ended up being oh, what he went to jail bonds. for. Um, uh, I think it was wire fraud. What was the ultimate okay. thing? But yeah, the, 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 the generally the, the the problem was he was the king of junk bonds. Oh yeah, and there was a concern that all these junk bonds that were being sold were um, not truly accurate. We're not not fairly fairly disclosed. What are what are junk bonds? I forget. Uh, a junk bond is a right. So it's a bond. It's a loan from the that you're making to the company, uh, and it is uh, relatively high risk, right? So bonds are sold in what's called. Uh, they have different levels of security, meaning one or priority. One person can get will be. Let's say the bank, company goes bankrupt. The first order of people who get paid have the highest security. Uh, the second people who get paid have the next level of security. And eventually you're the sort of the last people in line. That's basically the junk bonds, right? That means they're highly risky. There's a very high chance in the case that the company goes bankrupt that you won't get paid. Uh, and that's what a junk bond is. Like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> you want to be in early. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> before, before the population runs out at the other end of the pyramid. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk about bankruptcy. What's the point of bankruptcy? It hardly seems fair that the uh, creditors don't get paid. Uh, you know, apparently Trump has done this multiple times. Uh, you know, Alex Jones just had that massive judgment against him. Yeah, a billion dollars. Good luck collecting. <laughs> and then, you know, he just declared bankruptcy. So why does the government allow people to do that? I mean, it, it doesn't seem fair to the creditors. What's the argument there? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, the alternative, right, would be uh, debtors jails, which might not be <laughs> right. which might not be preferable given their long history in, Engl in English history. Yeah. Um, so I think the idea, right, is uh, we want to have an opportunity. To, so one, there's there's corporate bankruptcies and there's individual bankruptcies, uh, right? Individuals, right? We don't want to send people to jail because they couldn't pay their medical bill at the end of the day. Uh, so that's <laughs> that's the reason why we have bankruptcy for. Um, uh, for individuals. For corporations, the case is, I think, harder. You obviously can't send a corporation to jail. Um, but you could say, um, okay, so what happens when they've completely run out of money uh, and they can't pay their employees, they can't pay their debtors? What do you do? Uh, so one system would be simply to say, we're going to shut you down entirely. Uh, everybody, you can't come into the office anymore. Everything stops. Another alternative, though, and the one that is an option nowadays for corporations to say, we're going to keep operating and it'll be under the uh, uh, guidance of a court and they will try to make sure that you can keep running and become profitable in the future so that you can pay off all those people who you currently can't pay off. And that's the idea behind um, uh, reorganization today is, well, it's, there are some systems where there's a company that has struggled, but we think that we can get more for shareholders, more for debtors, if they keep running, then if they just totally shuttered all their operations now. Mm. That's the idea of too big to fail. The, the, the government just has to step in. There's too many people whose lives would be affected. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're worried about, we're worried about companies becoming so large that if they failed, if they went bankrupt, then it would affect all of us. And there's you know, a long, over the last 20 years, we've developed those rules to try to protect ourselves from, particularly too big to fail financial institutions. Mm, like AIG. Yep. Yep. Lehman. Lehman. Was Lehman the one where they, they actually just locked the doors and said, you can't come in and get your stuff? <laughs> yeah. 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 Lehman, of course, is the, uh, uh, it's oftentimes used as an example of too big to fail. But of course, the irony is that it did fail. <laughs> we, we did let it fail. Uh, and there were real ramifications, right? We went into a, a, a financial crisis for several years. Right. Okay. And other news stories uh, plucked up the headlines, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. Uh, I mean, I, I never invested in any because I really couldn't understand it. I read the explainers. I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I got the stock market here, which, you know, I'm going to get my eight to 10% every year for the next 30 years on average. That's pretty much guaranteed. I don't have to do anything in this over here. Uh, I don't know. looks pretty dicey. Yeah, so I wrote a book. I wrote a book on on blockchain and cryptocurrencies, and it sort of explored uh, the history, how they came about, the initial founder, this guy named Satoshi Nakamoto, this oh, hidden right. figure that we all just still don't know who he is. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a total mystery. Whoa, 
Yeah, it's an amazing story. Right? It's sort of amazing this massive trillion dollar industry was created by a guy that nobody knows. <laughs> it's still is completely anonymous. Why um, doesn't he want to be the Rockefeller or Carnegie of his <laughs> of his time? You know, he might be dead. Who knows? Okay. He's like QAnon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Letting little drops here and there. Ooh, that could be him. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, the funny so, thing about that was when I, when I was writing the book, I was constantly, I wrote the book, it was published in 2020. And I was constantly worried at the time that this thing, this whole industry is going to explode. It's not going to exist by the time the book is done. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, but it didn't. I mean, it went, in fact, it went the opposite way. The, you know, really skyrocketed in the, in the two years after the publication. Um, and there have, of course, been many uh, peaks and troughs in this recent, crisis that FTX is, is fascinating and has obviously led to a massive drop in the price of cryptocurrency. Do you think this could lead to the collapse of the entire system? It'll just be gone in another couple of years? It could. I mean, some people are saying that it will. will. Um, but it might not. So one of the reasons why it might not is that Bit Bitcoin was created as a system that was decentralized out of the control of any individual. It's run by a bunch of computers Anybody can go in and download the software and start running, keeping, keeping Bitcoin alive. Um, that means that it's very hard to get rid of. Even if a government wanted to shut it down, it couldn't. Not unless it deleted all copies of this software from every computer around the world that has it. And so it's basically impossible to shut down. So that means that it's going to be, it's going to take some really large efforts, or at least a complete lack of interest in it, uh, to continue for a long period of time before Bitcoin ever did, and, and I sort of doubt that it'll ever go completely to zero dollars. There'll always be some demand from somebody, or it is likely that for a very long period of time, there'll be some demand for, from somebody to keep running the software. So I think it'll keep going. Uh, where we'll go in terms of price, I really have no idea. Mm. All right, here's your man, Abraham Lincoln. And here's our other man, uh, Hamilton on the 20, right? Okay. Uh, so if I turn this in, I get uh, twenty dollars worth of gold. <laughs> no, okay. So why? What? What makes this valuable? Why would I trust this? Other than it says in God we trust on the back, which of course I'm an atheist, but I I do trust the government. I think the U.S. government is pretty stable. That's really what it is, right? That's fiat currency. It's it's valuable because my government says it's valuable and they're trustworthy. So we agree it's valuable. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the this is one of the most uh, fascinating parts of cryptocurrency is that it makes you think about these really. It makes you question these concepts that you've always accepted as sort of gospel, right? Yeah. Uh, it makes you think. Well, what is money? Do I really right. need to? One, should I even should I have any trust in this government issued you know coin or government issued piece of paper? Should I have any trust in that? And what's the difference between that and, and cryptocurrency? And there's been you know, very, there's been a lot of debate over the last 10 years since Satoshi Nakamoto first posted his white paper outlining Bitcoin. There's been a lot of debate about, well, what purposes uh, does money have? And how many of those are currently being met by cryptocurrencies? And to be honest, I think there's argument, good arguments on both sides, right? One of the, there's lots of benefits from cryptocurrency, right? It's anonymous. It's relatively um, uh, easy to use. You can uh, send it relatively quickly. You don't need to have carry it around in a big wallet. There's also big downsides, right? You can lose it. You can get hacked. Um, so, it, but it does make you wonder. Well, why? Why is it the cryptocurrency has one value rather than another? Should it, should its value be zero or a hundred thousand dollars? Both of those are values that people have assigned to it. <laughs> um, it makes you, it also makes you think. Well, what value should be assigned to a U.S. dollar? Should a U.S. Why do we really think that? Why do, I, why do I work all my days in order to get these you know, dollars? Well, it's because I think that in the future, I will be able to use those dollars for something, which means that I think that other people are going to value it in the future. So it's really trust. It's really trust. Right, right. A little bit like the stock market. I mean, I don't really pay attention that closely to the profits and losses and earnings and all those ratios and all those other eh, metrics that all the... Uh, stock market newsletter guys send me. <laughs> I just, I just say, well, what is everybody else gonna think is gonna happen if Elon does this or Google does that or Apple brings out a new pro product? I'm not thinking about how much Apple's gonna actually make on the next iPod. I'm just thinking about what everybody else thinks, and they're thinking about what everybody else thinks. Everybody else is thinking in kind of a meta way. Yeah, 
That's right. Yeah, the stock market, right, is a, you don't want to call it a pyramid scheme, but it is based <laughs> on, it is based on the belief that somebody else is going to be going to be willing to pay for it, pay a higher price in the future than what you paid for it today. Uh, obviously, there is a lot more underlying it than simply that. There is actually, there are actually functioning companies mm -hmm. out there that are selling goods yeah. and providing services that are receiving cash on a regular basis. Uh, so there's a lot more to it. They have factories, they have actual assets. So there's a lot more to it than that. But certainly one of the important features of the stock exchange is simply a prediction about what other people are going to do in the future. Uh, yeah. And so that, in a sense, it shares with cryptocurrency is that we're assigning values based on what we think somebody else is going to do. The difference is that cryptocurrencies have, one, a lot less history behind them. And two, for the most part, a lot less operational fun functionality. Right? They don't have those operated. They're not an Apple that's building iPhones. Uh, there is innovation in it, but so far none of those have really led to the, the kind of product that you know a typical corporation provides. So if pretty much every store I went into had a little sign saying, we accept crypto uh, or Bitcoin or FTX you know, values or whatever it would be, then, I, then I'd go, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, sure. Everybody else is doing it. Yeah. And at the beginning, that was the problem, right? Was uh, when, so when Satoshi Nakamoto first launched Bitcoin, he said, well, how do you create, how do you create a new money system? Uh, right. and, uh, and so how did he do it? Well, at first it was just hype, right? He would send it out to message boards. He would say, oh, look, I'm downloading the software. It's pretty cool. Check it out. Some other people started using it. Uh, but the real breakthrough when it first started um, uh, be becoming popular was when people started accepting it for real services. And what were those services? Not good services. <laughs> so there were these dark web websites that would sell things oh, that right. they didn't drugs want to sell and... on the street corner, right? Right. right. Uh, right. Drugs and guns and right. um, uh, illegal products. Right. Uh, and there was this company called the Silk Road that famously oh, right. Uh, right. was selling you know you know millions of dollars of drugs every year and, and other bad things. I think Hitmen even it's even sold sold Hitmen, uh, oh, and it was accepting Bitcoin. And so people said, oh, well, maybe, maybe this cryptocurrency really is valuable. <laughs> I'm willing to buy some in order to go get some <laughs> right, drugs. Right. Uh, and that was when it started hitting the mainstream. Right. Like I, and at some, one of the retail stores around here had a little sign, we, we don't accept Apple Pay. I'm like, okay, I don't use Apple Pay. But it's like, all right, yeah, so you really would need a momentum where everybody accepts it. I wanted to ask you about modern monetary theory. This is, you know, this argument that is, as long as the, government of the United States says it's okay to print more money. It's okay to print more money. I'm not sure I really understand this. Doesn't that just cause inflation ultimately if you just print money? Yeah, I, uh, I'm not an expert on mon mo modern monetary theory. Uh, I do think that there is a, I mean, I think there's a, it's a pretty, pretty good example in the last few years that monetary stimulus has led to inflation. I think that's hard to deny. And so I think that calls into question some of the fundamental principles of modern, modern monetary theory that we can print money with not massive consequences in terms of inflation, right? We've, we're facing some of the highest inflation we've seen uh, in decades. Uh, of course, not at the levels that we saw in the 1970s. So it could be that um, hopefully we don't go to that level of, uh, of interest rate, but, but it might be that not, that might be the future, right? We've gotten so used to, we're so, our economy is so dependent on having remarkably low historical interest rates. Um, yeah. I hope we don't go back to that world. How is raising interest rates supposed to stop slow inflation? Because, you know, if I'm a small business and now it costs me more money to get that loan from the bank to keep the supplies in my store, I got to charge more money because my monthly interest payments are higher. So my rates are going to go up. What am I missing here? <laughs> yeah, I think the idea is that it puts the brakes on the economy. And when you put the brakes, uh, higher interest rates put uh, the brakes on the economy. When you put brakes on the economy, it slows growth, and that should lower inflation uh, over the long term. Um, I think that's at least the theory, and it's been proven. I don't know. I don't know if it's, like, it's sort of physically proven, <laughs> but it's certainly there is strong evidence that it actually does work. Uh, but you're right; you could imagine theoretical reasons, right, why why um, why raising interest rates might actually increase uh, increase inflation, right? For, for the precise reason you mentioned, it's more expensive to get a loan. Well, I'm just going to charge people more. Um, so you can imagine. Uh, theoretical arguments for the opposite. It just turns out that historically we have found that it works the way that, that we traditionally think of it as working. 
I always like these news stories when gas prices go way up, you know. They always got the reporter standing outside the Chevron station with the numbers up there, you know. And uh, yeah, no one knows why this is, well, why don't you ask the guy in the in the Chevron store why he put the bigger numbers up there, you know. And he'll say, well, the boss told me. And then uh, his boss and then somebody in Chevron somewhere said, we're going to raise the rates because we can or because oil costs, crude oil costs us more or whatever the reason is. Yeah, I do think this is, I mean, this is, it's a great point, right? The point is, the point is that actually, this is one of the reasons why we love, why we don't, why we hate, we hate corporations, but at the same time, they're so essential and they work so much better than all the alternatives, right? Yeah. The reason why, right, your local gas station raises its price is because of all these things, all these things through the supply chain, right? They're getting all these signals from uh, oil companies and the oil companies are responding to signals from uh, their suppliers, uh, and it basically just aggregates this is a great hive mind of all these companies that are out there uh, changing their prices, responding to demand, and it all aggregates to, well, at the end of the day, that's how much you have to pay when you go to the gas, the gas meter, right? It's, and it just turns out that that system is a lot more efficient, much better for economic growth than all the other systems that we've created in history. Yeah, right. So if laptops were made by some mom and pop store, this laptop I'm on the MacBook Pro would cost I don't know twenty thousand bucks rather than twenty five hundred bucks, and my little iPhone here would probably cost ten thousand bucks rather than whatever I paid for this seven hundred bucks. Uh, it's just an efficiency. It's good for everybody. Yep. Yeah. The the example I like to give is uh, my my watch b broke the other day. I think it cost you know thirty dollars uh, when I <laughs> to buy new. Uh, right. And I went and I and I thought oh I, all I need is a new battery. I'm just going to get a new battery. <laughs> And so I went and I thought, oh, I'll go to my local watch store. So I went to my local watch store and he said, that'll be $30 for you to replace the, Just buy to a replace new one, the, replace right. the battery. And it's a great right. example, right? About what is the uh, one about how unbelievably efficient that you can create this modern marvel of engineering <laughs> of a watch. Uh, and it all costs $30 when it takes, when it costs $30 for, you know, a 10, 10 minute uh, uh, battery change. And so it gives you a sense of just how efficient corporations are. It also right. shows you one of the downsides, which is that there's a really strong encouragement to consume and a really strong encouragement to waste, right? I, I'm just going to say, well, I'll just throw this thing out. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Go with a new yeah. one. Yeah, it's a little bit like the the extra warranties they try to sell you on a TV or a toaster or a microwave. It's like, why would I bother? Just buy a new one if it breaks. It's so much cheaper. <laughs> exactly. That's the, that's the invisible hand sending you some bad signals. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know what I forgot to ask you about in the 19th century. Uh, do you think slavery would have fallen into economic disuse through capitalism and markets without a civil war? Would it have lasted into the 20th century? I don't know. What, uh, I don't really know the answer to that, but it's a curious question. I mean, it's a it's a really big question. And, and obviously, a lot of scholars have talked have, have discussed whether or not uh, slavery would have gone would would have been eliminated even absent um, uh, the civil war. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a strong answer. One thing that I will say uh, is that in the Civil War, when they were doing these, uh, when, when there was this massive violent conflict, one of the things that Abraham Lincoln was hopeful about was the idea that they was going to have companies, corporations bringing together the nation, right? That one way to overcome these, these deep divisions, these deep ideological divisions, this violence was enterprise, right? If we can make everybody more profitable, if we can make everybody more prosperous, right? That is a great way to bring people together. Uh, and so I think that's, that's, that's my takeaway uh, from the story, at least of the Union Pacific, was that there was this real belief that um, if we had a successful corporation that was able to uh, provide a project that benefited everybody, um, it would be, it would be a, a, a great benefit to the nation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Adam Smith wrote about that, didn't he? Write about slavery and its economics, uh, and what the motive of the slave trader would be, and so on. I, but I forget what he said about that now. Yeah, it's an interesting moral issue. I mean, there's the moral agitation for it, of course, and the British went through that before we did, abolishing the slave trade. What in 1802 or three, something like that. Uh, it may be sometimes the government just has to say, "You're not doing this anymore. That's it," right? <laughs> if we want that kind of moral progress, not everything can come about from the bottom up through cultural trends and changes of norms and economic incentives and so on. Um, okay, since I uh, let's we're coming up on that. Well, we are at ninety minutes here. At my kind of my natural. Like I had Andrew Yang on the podcast talking about a UBI, Universal Basic Income. 
you know, he's really worried about this. Are you worried about this? That is namely automation, putting just masses of people out of work. It's not like these truck drivers and taxi drivers are going to become Google programmers, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of crazy. What are they going to do that we need? The government needs to step in and do something like a universal basic income. Your thoughts? Uh, I'm not worried about it. Not yet. Uh, I don't think that uh, even with this latest sort of remarkable chat GPT uh, oh, right. uh, development, <laughs> you know, right. for the most part, with the with the, the the technologists that I've spoken with have told me that, you know, AI is remarkable in all these ways, but it's only, you know, 80, 90 percent accurate. Right. You can get you can get to a certain level, but you're never going to be able to replace the human. Right. There's this famous there was this these researchers that just a couple years ago uh, did a. Uh, they, they, they did some research on self-driving cars. And one of the things that they showed was that you could put a, uh, a stop sign, right? That any human being would be able to see, okay, that's a stop sign, I should stop. But if you put these three or four black dots, really small, right? Wouldn't change a human's reading of it at all. If you put them in the right spots, they could get a self-driving algorithm to misidentify it 100% of the time, right? 100% of the time, by putting a few dots on the stop sign, they could trick the algorithm. Uh, and I think that gives you a sense of uh, some of the limitations, right? There's all of these things that AI technology can't do, can't replace us. I don't think we're in the world, right, of super computers are going to come in and uh, destroy us. We're not in the world of Terminator. Uh, so not a big <laughs> concern. Uh, we have many other concerns <laughs> that we should be focusing on before we focus on. You're not a wor worried about AI turning us all into paper clips? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of follow this. We've covered a, a little bit in, in Skeptic, and it's like, I don't know. Come on. There's a little too much thought experiments. Like, if this happens, then this and this and this. And oh, my God. It's like, yeah, but there's like 20 steps in there. And if any one of them breaks, then there's no problem, right? <laughs> exactly. It's a great thought experiment. I don't think we're quite in the world of, you know, policy. And also, never, never underestimate the power of the government regulatory state to step in and say, you're not doing that anymore, <laughs> right? The moment I program my my Tesla to take me to LAX and it takes me around the traffic up and on a sidewalk to mow down some pedestrians. It's over. It's, over. You know, it's not like Elon's going to keep doing this. No, it's exactly. going to stop. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I got a guy up here, one of my cycling buddies. Uh, he works for this company, uh, Green Hills software in Santa Barbara and his boss, Dan O'Dowd has kind of taken it upon himself to go after Elon Musk and the whole self-driving technology. He thinks it's a disaster looming soon. And, you know, and Elon's like, we're going to release this anything. And he's been saying we're five years away for, I don't know, you know, like 25 years now, whatever it is, five years away. It always will be. <laughs> it seems like to me, I would never drive my Tesla on self-driving except, except on the freeway, left lane, 405, when there's nothing to do, right? <laughs> no turns to make, no oncoming truck. Yeah, but, um, oh, but anyway, Dan has been running these full page ads like in the New York Times, taking out commercials, showing the Tesla, like just bl like what you just said, like blasting through a, a uh, intersection where there's a, like a little a test dummy child and just poof, runs right over. Okay, so it's, we're just not really close to this. But w wh why the panic? I mean, it's just, okay, so it's not ready. So maybe it's another 20 years. Maybe it never <clears> happens. <throat> Who knows? Yeah, I mean, I will say we have some self-driving cars driving around our neighborhood. Lately, and they are by far the worst drivers. In the really, really. Yeah, I don't know why oh, they're wow. so bad, but the ones that we have are not good. Uh, so I'm not too worried. I mean, I'm worried in the sense that they're not very good and they might cause some harm. Um, I'm not worried about them totally replacing. Us. Although to be honest, I would love to. Uh, I would love to have a self-driving car world. It would save us a lot of time and energy. Well, yes, uh, on average, right? Uh, c compared to apes driving cars, <laughs> which make all kinds of errors, you know, it'd probably be yeah. well. What, what does that Elon say? Like 10% of the 40,000 people a year that die. So maybe 4,000, but you know, only one that gets killed because of AI. That's, you know, the regulatory state will, will jump on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It's a, it's a utilitarian calculus, but also has a moral valence to it that, mm, I don't know, AI killing 4,000 people. I don't think that's going to fly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It raises some real moral, moral hackles, even if we do think that, you know, it'll save lives. Yeah, the other argument uh, Dan was making to me is that, you know, a, a, t a terrorist could hack the software system online, you know, elect electric car, they're online, your nav system, you're on the internet, right? So they could take over your steering and steer all the Teslas all at once into a, into the side of the wall, you know, like a terrorist attack, right? Thousands of people would die in a, in a single incident. Okay, why aren't they, why haven't they done this? 
you know, airplane airliners are all online. They're, you know, on the internet. They're, why can't the terrorists take over the the uh, towers and then direct them all into the, you know, crash or whatever? What they haven't done that. Why is that? And it, it maybe it's just much harder to do that. Maybe the software is better than we think it is, or I don't know what. Yeah, I, I wish I knew too. I'd be I'd be very <laughs> curious to know the answer. I know that hackers are always up to up to no good. Yeah, exactly. Or they just do something like what that 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 group did. Uh, where was it? North Carolina, where they just shot up with a gun, just shot up the power station. Astonishing. You don't need s- super sophisticated software technology. You can use a gun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, William. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for your book. What's uh, next on your uh, on on your plate for writing? Well, I'm working on a new book. It's a history of law. It's even even more ambitious. Still, still on the history very... of law. Wow, <laughs> that's huge. Isn't everyone that a huge everyone advised me not to write this book, so we'll see whether it ever gets the light of, gets to the light of day. But I'm excited about it at the moment. How, how far back will you go? Oh, it's got to start. Well, I'm start with I'm starting Hammurabi? with ancient Athens, the Athenian oh, court, a- Asia. Oh, Socrates, okay. all the good stuff. All right. Oh, wow. Right. Right. Well, I do want to talk about that. Probably not today. Is it? I mean, really, the legal it's it's a it, it's a le, it's a signal detection problem that should be analyzed using rational uh, and empirical evidence. You know that we, we you know Blackstone's ratio, right? Better ten guilty people go free than that one gets innocent. Looks like with the Innocence Project, we're not meeting that ratio too well, at least for the death penalty and and serious crimes like that. Yeah, it's an interesting problem. Do you, do you have a sense that we're making moral progress in the legal system? I mean, compared to you know torture and the death penalty and burning witches and all that over the centuries. Oh yeah, I think that the uh, for, from my perspective, the the progress is undeniable. Right, you yeah. go back to the 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 type of system that was available in medieval England. We are <laughs> a lot. We are we are very, we should all be very grateful <laughs> we live in the time that we do. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think there were 220 crimes for the, the for uh, capital punishment crimes, including like insulting the king's garden. <laughs> right. Yep. There's a uh, there's a great uh, there's something called the law of the forest where it does not is not nearly as nice as the forest sounds. It's basically just anything you do in the forest will lead to terrible terrible punishments because the forest is is for the king alone. Oh right, right. Or the test of the witch. Right. If she drowns. And she's innocent. <laughs> if she floats, she's guilty. So we burn her at the stake. <laughs> Done deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hard to deny that we've made some progress in the world of law. Uh, yeah. But uh, hopefully, we can. Hopefully, we can continue to make progress. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll save that conversation for when you finish that book and come back on. Thank you very much. It's such right, a pleasure being on.